Hello, I'm Nadine Shaw. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. How did it all begin? Music? Yes. Okay, <laughs> let's specify. It could be a long... Your birth. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Um, it was a cesarean. Um, I haven't been writing for that long, actually. I've been writing my own music for three years. And pretty soon after I wrote my first song, um, I got picked up by a management company, like a really nice guy who was living in London, who then recommended me to some different producers. And it was pretty soon after, it was like four or five months after I'd written my first song, that I was in touch with my now producer, Ben Hillier. And then since then, we've just been making the album. So it's all pretty simple. and songwriting, where do you draw your inspiration from? All kinds of places. Um, it could be like, oh, there's no kind of like set method or routine for it. It's like, it could be like a, a conversation overheard or like um, dialogue from a film. Um, usually that's where I get inspiration for lyrics from. Um, and I'm usually drawn to kind of the more macabre subjects as well. Any specific films that really have touched you? So many. Um, for dialogue, one that stands out is like a modern film um, was Revolutionary Road, and it's I mean, that's like a quite a big Hollywood film. It had Kate Winslet and you know DiCaprio in it, but it had uh, this brilliant, brilliant dialogue. So that was quite inspiring for a new one. A wonderful talker. If black could be made into white by talking, you'd be the man for the job. So now I'm crazy because I don't love you, right? Is that the point? No, wrong. You're not crazy, and you do love me. That's the point, April. What was the dialogue? Oh, all sorts. It was kind of that film set in like amongst like the beat generation, just outside in the suburban area, outside of New York, um, and about this kind of young couple who were kind of beatniks and creatives in their own time. But then they just kind of get dragged down by monotony of kind of like uh, normality, kind of like having kids, getting married, getting jobs and money. So why don't we go there? You're serious? Yes. What's stopping us? Um, so yeah, there's always just interesting conflict between the two of them. Most of the dialogue is between those guys. So in terms of the themes of like monotony, what other, other themes do you draw upon for um, like the topics of your songs or what are particular subjects that you find really relevant to your songwriting and your career and even your audience? Oh, I mean, the, nothing that sounds that innovative or, or groundbreaking, just kind of your regular subjects of like loss, lust, uh, revenge, um, those kind of things. So never like a love song. <laughs> it's always about you know, being out of love. But I, I always like these songs where people take a kind of a tired old subject, but they put their own personal twist on it. He was everything. Um, so that's what I try and do with those subjects. So um, you started out with an EP, two EPs, and now your album's coming out soon. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, the album is called Love Your Dumb and Mad, um, which is like a play on words. It's a spoonerism, mm -hmm. which is like, a, it just means play on words. Okay. And I just called it that because I like saying the word spoonerism in interviews. <laughs> no one says that word enough, spoonerism. Um, yeah, the album's out on uh, Monday the 22nd of July. And it's just a relief to finally get it out because we've been making it for near enough three years. Um, but then at the same time, it's terrifying so it's a like your first piece of work that you're presenting. So is there any particular favourite song of yours or something that you're particularly proud of? Um, I'm kind of quite proud of the, of the album as a whole just because prior to writing my own material, I was a jazz singer and singing other people's songs. But yeah, there's a, there's a few tracks that kind of stand out on there, but I, I hear them so much, you know, like I haven't really got one I, want, I really listen to or anything, but um, I think lyrically there's one called Filthy Game, 
which I'm, I'm kind of proud of the lyrics on it. It was quite good, I think, I hope. In the town where all men stole and everything that could was talk him from him and her from her from silver plates to books. It's, uh, it's based on a short story by an Italian author called Italo Calvino. So it's just, uh, I know you'll have to hear it. <laughs> I'll send you a copy. Um, yeah, it's, it's so basically the song. It hasn't really got a particular chorus. It's just like three short verses and it's kind of like, um, like a, it's told in like a real story type thing, but like old English almost. In Drury Town, um, you say, I'm not going to follow you to the ground. Darling, I'm leaving this Drury Town. I'm not going to follow you to the ground when there's greener pastures waiting to be found. So it's beautiful. So could you tell us, like, you know, how you wrote that and um, what kind of, you know, process you went through? Um, that's the first song I ever wrote. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really strange like, hearing the lyrics yeah. read back. Um, yeah, unfortunately, that you've started with the really morbid one. <laughs> so this interview's going to go. Um, a friend passed away, and I wrote a song about him. Um, but a lot of the album, thematically, a lot of it is about uh, two friends that passed away who suffered from mental illnesses. Um, so we've been working with, like, uh, I'm trying to get involved with working with some mental health charities, and uh, just kind of that, that's lyrically what that one's about. Unfortunately, the loss of a really great friend. Say like there's a specific audience you're trying to send a message to, or would you say this is more of your catharsis or more of your outlet? Uh, it was never intended to be something which was going to be um, heard, actually. So there was never that audience in mind when I was writing it. Um, I think it was possibly, yeah, possibly the songs were therapeutic when I was writing them. about um, your album title. Obviously, it's Love Your Dumb and Man. Um, no, it was, just, it was a, just a play on words. And it was a title of, uh, of a painting by my friend, one of my friends who passed away. And he does all the, um, all the artwork on the EP sleeves and on the album sleeve, and they're his paintings. He was, a one, he was a brilliant artist. And it was a title of one of his paintings, Love Your Dumb and Mad. So, um, and it just, for me, it was kind of, it was funny the first time I'd heard that title. I thought it was hilarious and quite innovative and clever. Um, but then also there's the connotations of what it means, like when we were saying like the stigmas of mental health and what have you. And then I put part of the title into one of the songs called Floating on the album. So many people have described your sound as, as kind of gloomy and a little dark, but how would you describe your sound? Because, I mean, writing and performing is different. It's a different feel to what the audience is experiencing. Yeah, gloomy and dark. Yeah. Sums it up just by... Um, I, su I suppose, like, to me, I don't find it that gloomy or that dark. I suppose it is quite gloomy and quite dark, um, with a lot of the themes, like titles being quite the devil. Mm. And like the only kind of like reference to weather in it is winter rains, so it's never about a sunny day. Um, <laughs> understandably so. So I get, I get comparisons to other artists who also make, for want of better words, like you know, gloomy and dark music, like PJ Harvey or Nick Cave. Um, I don't really mind that because it seems there's a lot of people who are into that type of music. that over the progression of your two EPs and your album, do you think that your sound is going to develop into something different or are you going to stick to your sound and what do you think? Um, 
Yeah, I've been, been asked that a few times about the new material I've been writing. Um, I don't know, I'm, to be honest. Um, there's like no secrets. It's like someone tried to get an exclusive the other day, going, what are we going to get next? It's probably more of the same, to be honest, because like the themes that I'm drawn to are always going to be the same kind of things. But um, things like technically, um, I'm probably be playing some new instruments and hopefully lyrical contents may be progressed. I hope. So what instruments do you play now? Uh, just piano. Um, I've taken up guitar. I'm not very good at it. But um, I mean, even piano I'm not great at playing. Uh, I just managed to get a sound out of it. So guitar and bass I'm playing with a lot at the moment. Um, but playing with like distortion pedals and those are weird things. Um, I think what I'll do in the next album is limit myself to four or five instruments for the whole of the band to play. We have to make something out of this. But hopefully I'll be playing more guitar on it, I hope. What are your other inspirations in terms of artists or even like, um, like fine artists, musicians? Um, I used to be, like, well, I was at art school, I say I was an artist, I dropped out. I was an art school dropout. But um, William Hogarth was kind of inspiring because um, like the themes that he would paint were always like debauchery, like Gin Lane, you've got like a mother with her baby falling in the river and she's drinking gin. And there's like dukes with these kind of like tarty women on their laps and they're drinking wine and they've, you know, the, the women have their bits out and everything's just, you know, sensory. It's, uh, I find that quite inspiring because I think they're quite dark images. Um, uh, characters and other musicians like Nina Simone, uh, her character and her vocal delivery. Ain't got no class, ain't got no skirts, ain't got no um, Poets, uh, Philip Larkin, he was really inspiring to me. Um, he writes very simply, his, um, his poetry isn't laced in metaphors, it's just kind of plain speak. And that's what I want to do lyrically with my own stuff. What do you imagine your audience, you know, how do you imagine them listening to it? How do you think that this will affect them in their lives? Oof. Uh, hopefully they haven't got like, hopefully they're sober when they're listening, they're not, haven't got, they're not around sharp objects or gin. Um, I really don't know, you know. Um, I think because of the way that the album is, it's not going to be one of those albums where you go like, you know, you just listen to one song. Oh, this is the hit. There's not really big songs on it like that, I, I don't think. Um, I think it's one of these ones that you'll have to, you sit and you listen to as an album as a whole. Well, that's what I try to do anyways. Um, if you compare the first song to the very last song, the first is industrial sounding and menacing, and the last is actually quite pretty and delicate. Um, so yeah, it would be really strange if the album was on, on shuffle, because we'd be like from there to there. Um, but I, I think it, it possibly is an album that needs more time and, and care from a listener. So where can we see you next? Are you performing anywhere? Yep, yeah, got some got some really great shows coming up um, in mid-September to October and we've got like 16 UK dates and then I'm in Europe uh, in November in like Berlin and we're, we're, we're kind of getting about. That's really really exciting. We wish you all the best of luck for that. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. Thank you.